Boxing King Media in association with Boxro, uh, a Middle East link up with uh, Matchroom CEO Frank Smith. Uh, Frank, we're both here on business, so I thought it'd be a perfect time to have a, a little bit of a catch up a couple of days after the Manchester show. How are you enjoying the sunshine? Yeah, good, mate. It's, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been out in the sun much today. Um, I wish I was here on holiday. It's a lovely place to come on holiday, but a few meetings. Um, but yeah, nice and warm, and we're out here. Look at this. Could be a, could be in many worse places than Abu Dhabi, couldn't we? Definitely. So, um, one of the first things I know I very rarely do icebreakers, Frank. But I thought, seeing as we're out here, but I, I should definitely do one. Obviously, a lot of people know that you started your matchroom journey as a, a work experience student at 14 years old, if I got that right. Um, so you've obviously known and worked alongside Eddie for a long time. In that time, you must have done something wrong. What's the worst bollocking you've ever had of Eddie? Are you able to share it? Yeah, it was only it was once, and it was all I needed to be honest. I turned up a few hours late. We, we were, I was working in poker. Um, and I turned up three hours late for filming. I was 16 years old and I cried my whole way on the way there. Oh, what's going on there? It's going to be a party. I cried my whole way there and then I, uh, and then when he got to the studios a few hours later, he came up, he plonked a letter on the desk and it was a final warning and I cried again all while I was doing work. It was the most boring work ever as well. I was logging the cards. So I was sitting there and I had to see on the, on the, uh, on the screen what cards would cut the poker players would have logged those and it was 12 hours or something like that but it was uh that's all i needed really ever since then we don't he doesn't really bollock me we have a few back and forth I, i've known him for so long now it's like I'm probably the only one who we have pro proper open discussions probably the heat most heated it gets uh but you know it's all for the good of he doesn't pay me to just say yes basically it's good to hear that. I'm, I'm going to flip the question. Obviously, you're now CEO at Matchroom. Uh, you're literally, you know, I mean, second in command in most people's eyes. What's the worst bulking you've given someone? Uh, there's been quite a few. I, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who, uh, who holds on to things. So I'll tell you, and then 30 seconds later, it's forgotten about. There's too many people hold on to grudges, and you can't do that because people do things wrong all the time. So I'm not like a big shouter. I might just give you a look of disappointment and I feel like that's enough. Apparently they say I'm the scariest person in the office, a few people, but you know, my missus doesn't believe it. But I, I, don't, I don't shout and scream, it's more just a look and that's all it takes. But you know, look, we, we do so much, we're doing 40 shows a year, things go wrong all the time. But uh, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be normal if, if things weren't going wrong, it can't all go right every day of the week, can it? Definitely not. I'd be daft not to ask you for, for the look. Are you able to share the look with us? Just sort of like a... I don't even know because people tell me I'm doing it and I'm not even sure I'm doing it. It's more like a just like, just disappointed look. Oh. Not an angry look, just like, why? And that's apparently enough. It's all it takes to, to, to get people going. I've actually seen that at a show before. I think I've seen you give that look to security when they were struggling to clear the arena out. So I've seen that look. Uh, let's move on to the boxing stuff. Um, first thing I want to speak to you about is Lorna Sokoli released a statement yesterday. Uh, in short, it looks like you know whatever issues you guys had have been cleared and sorted out. Um, so w why has it took so long? Has stuff been going on in the background while this fight's been going on as well? Yeah, look, I can't, can't obviously go into detail of it, like like he said in his statement. Um, yeah, look, it's obviously been going on in the background for a while, but um, we're happy with the, you know, with the situation, how it ended, uh, and wish wish Lawrence all the best in the future of his career. Like I say, I can't go into detail of what where we got to, but happy with the where, where the where the settlement ended. Would you work with Lawrence again if the opportunity ever came up and it made sense for both sides? Look, we would work. We work with everyone. You know, we will always work with everyone. We're, we're professionals in business. That's what we do. Um, so if an opportunity arose and it made sense for everyone, then I'm sure. You know, there's many a people that have had falling outs in the past, especially in boxing, who later down the line come together and work together again. So you should never say never because so many times in the past we've said wouldn't do this, wouldn't do that, and then five years later it happens. So um, yeah, look, if the right opportunity arose, maybe. But you know, he's got his own his own deal now um, with Boxer and, and wish them all the best. I think it's just touching on that. We saw the other day with O'Hara Davis and Eddie. Looks like you know, considering what Eddie said. Um, Oh, Hara said over the years, it looks like they're, they're kind of made up. Yeah, I know. It's good as well because, 
again with fighters you know look, I wish all fighters all the best because they're you know it's a hard, hard sport they're in um, a dangerous sport and they deserve the best for their careers and you know we will always stand by that and want to deliver the best for fighters sometimes it doesn't you know people don't always see eye to eye you know it was a shame with O'Hara we worked with him from the early days I think Eddie said in his interview the other day he didn't agree with some of the statements that O'Hara made at the time some of the things he did um, but yeah look like, like everything people change people learn and grow um, and you know I'm sure you know, even with O'Hara Davis as well, they, with, with the history we've had there, I'm sure there's potential in the in the future to work together for sure. Interesting stuff. Uh, Fabio Wortley was ringside on Saturday in Manchester, and so was Dave Allen. I think they had a bit of a face-off picture together, but I think it was all respectful. Um, from what I understand, Fabio doesn't now have an opponent, and he's still looking to fight end of July, early August. Uh, how realistic is it with Dave Allen being the opponent? And have you made any uh, talks with Dave? Uh, had a few discussions. I mean, nothing set in stone. There's a few options we w we're looking at for Fabio. Um, the plan is for end of July for him to fight, and that's what we're working towards. Like I say, no concrete discussions yet on the opponent, um, but a few names circling around currently. Interesting stuff. Um, but Dave looks well, by the way. It's the first time I've seen him in quite a while. He looks really like I'm g happy for him because he's had tough times as well, but he looks in good shape. Looks like he's really taken care of himself, so good to see. Yeah, it definitely needs commending on that because most people, when they have kids, they put weight on, and he looks like he's lost weight. Yeah, you know, and it just generally looks healthy as well. You know, like I say, he's been through some hard times, Dave Allen, and uh, good to see you know people looking well. Definitely. So uh, you're obviously in Abu Dhabi. Um, over the last few months, we've heard Eddie constantly mention you know Conor Ben's next fight could happen in Abu Dhabi. June third was the ta date. Obviously, that's fallen through now. Uh, are you here for a Conor Ben fight, or are you here just? to concrete, uh, set up a concrete date for the next event? Yeah, look, we're here broadly across a, a number of things, you know, the date for the next event, the wider partnership with the DCT and the Sports Council in Abu Dhabi, um, and, and really looking to grow the sport in a long term. It, for, for us, all of these partnerships are all about long term growth. You know, it's all good coming into a new market, doing a show and never coming back. But that's never the aim for us. It's about building something that we can build on for years to come. And we want to build the sport of boxing in Abu Dhabi and the UAE, like they've done with a number of other sports. You know, UFC, they've done a tremendous job here. You know, we, even lately, you know, with Fight Island and everything they did throughout the COVID period. Um, so for us, we, we see a massive opportunity in Abu Dhabi. You know, great to deal with, great to work with. And we've been working over the last, you know, sort of six, eight months since our last show to really put together a concrete plan not rush it as well you know for us it's a long-term partnership you know not just 10 15 years but for for a long time to come um, so it's about building a plan that works and we can grow and build out upon like I say with major shows as well as grassroots you know shows with people from throughout the region uh, as well as the amateur system and trying to build that up and you know with the long-term aim of building some Olympic stars from the UAE so they look like very big ambitions and uh, with, with regards to that, um, is there a set plan as to how many dates you should have in Abu Dhabi or is it just kind of open depending on what fights are available? You know, look, obviously they want major fights but at the same time, like I say, we want to grow, grow the grassroots fights. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a couple of smaller events a year, you know, uh, to build the local audience and then a couple of major events a year. So that's what we're tr really trying to build up now. But it all it all comes as part of a you know an overall approach to to grow the sport here, and that's throughout the amateur clubs as well. Um, and it, it takes a while to get that plan in place. Like I say, it's quite easy to come and put a show on anywhere in the world. You can do that in three four weeks time. Um, but to build a build out a plan of how we grow the sport here, that's you know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort from a number of different people. So that's the you know that's the continued discussions now and. Um, yeah, looking to get things up and running for a, another show probably September time hopefully. Uh, how does it work compared to like you know when you deal with skills challenge and Prince Khalid from my understanding he kind of chooses the fights he'll say I want A to fight B and because he's a boxing fan with the DCT is it a case of you guys proposing fights or or do they look and say right oh, we want you bank Ben here for, as an example? Look, we work with them to propose fights that make sense for them they, they have different objectives for, for different fights you know a lot of it is obviously led by tourism for, the, for them um, and a lot of the time looking at different nationalities of where makes sense, where they want to bring tour tourists in from. So, you know, we, we work closely with them to, to fill their, fulfill their objectives. 
Um, but you know, we, we'll go to them with a number of different fights, and it's an ongoing process that we work through. But you know, we know what we need to deliver and what, what we need to do to succeed. It. When I spoke to Amir Abdul of Skills Challenger a while back, one of the things I asked him was, you know, how do you kind of control the fact that obviously when people want to make fights with the Arab world, they're aware that there's big money on the table. So how do you kind of, like, uh, in a way, when you're making them negotiations, kind of meet in the middle? Because obviously they know that you're here to collect the bag, if I excuse the pun, but at the same time, you've got to be respectful and kind of do it so it's kind of works out for both parties, if you know what I mean. Yeah, look, every deal has to work out for both parties. And I think what when I say about the long-term partnership, that's about building something to succeed. Too many people in, you know, in boxing, well, not just in boxing, but would come here and look for a one-off deal to make more money than they've ever made. Um, you know, look, every business is commercially driven to make money, I understand that. But at the same time, you need to build something long-term. And, you know, for us, it's all about that for every sport we're in. Um, you know, we want to look at opening an office here as well. Um, and yeah, look, it is, there is that concept, you know, sort of that idea of there's going to be 10 times the money if we go to the Middle East for this fight. But at the same time, we have to adjust that a little bit as well because we want to, you know, we want to build long term in all of these territories. And the only way you do that is by delivering. Um, and there's only so many times someone's going to overpay for something that doesn't have the value that's set against it and then you lose the opportunity forever. So, like I say, it's all about long term here for us um, and that's where a lot of people go wrong, I believe. You know, they're always looking for that one day where they can make 10 or 15 million dollars and, you know, it's not, it's not the right way to go about it. Uh, that, that leads me on to uh, the Eubank Junior Ben fight, and I know you said last week that you know boxers aren't very good at you know, putting clauses in contracts, etc. Have you had a chance to look at Eubank Junior's contract, and have you made any inroads in regards to that? And do you know if you're able to make an approach? Look, we don't, we wouldn't deal obviously with Eubank's contract. It's for uh, Wasserman to obviously provide that information that they're free and clear to enter into negotiations. Um, you know, we wouldn't have any right to look at their contracts. If, if a party says they're open to negotiate and work on a fight, then, you know, it's standard procedure all the way through the world. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the conversations we'll continue to have. And, you know, I believe the fight can get made for sure. Have Wasserman made an approach to make to notify if they are available to discuss uh, a Conor Ben fight uh, whilst all this uh, Liam Smith situation is still ongoing? Look, I speak to Callis Howland nearly every day. Actually, too much for my own like. You know, we we we're on the phone. I speak to Callis more than I speak to my missus actually most days. Um, so you know, we're we're always in discussions around opportunities, and uh, you know, for sure, the fight will be made if it can be made and we're working through all that detail now. Good skills there, Frank. Um, with regards to that fight, I know you talked about making the right fights in Abu Dhabi. That seems like a fight that would attract tourists uh, to, to this country. Is that potentially one of the fights that here, you're here discussing? Should it be uh, able to be made? Yeah, look, there's obviously a huge expat population in not just in the UAE but all across the region um, so I believe you know it would be a huge driver for, for those people you know across Dubai especially as well coming into Abu Dhabi um, and I believe there'd be huge traveling you know interest from the UK as well you know and that's why we want to get out thinking long term we want to build this schedule out early enough to actually allow people the opportunity to book and travel over here um, you know, yes, it's a fight that will form part of discussions amongst many other fights we, you know, we put forward. Uh, ultimately, when we work with the DCT, we're working for them. We're delivering a, the, the event that, you know, delivers the the most success for them for their targets. So we'll review, you know, five, ten, fifteen fights, and and work with them to to decide what works best for them. And, and also longer term as well, in terms of thinking about what fights could work for sort of March, April time next year and thinking about what big fights and what opportunities are there. You know, another one I've been looking at is Bivo against the winner of Baturbiev and Callum Smith. You know, that undisputed fight, massive fight, and I think that's a great fight that could really work in this market. Um, so yeah, it, it forms a discussion, but amongst many fights. The last question on the, the Conor Ben and Eubank Jr. fight. Obviously, we're still waiting to hear the conclusion of Conor's hearing with UCAD. Um, I know, because I asked Eddie a while ago, and he said no matter what happens in that hearing, Connor will fight this year. So let's just say if the the result is obviously not good for him, is that fight still going to be classed as a professional bout, or could it potentially be an exhibition with like 
with still uh, determining a winner? No, it would still be a professional belt. Um, you know, Conor Ben would be licensed. It would be licensed by, uh, you know, a professional authority that has the right to license fights. Um, but you know, those discussions and those, you know, the, the UCAD piece is still ongoing. So let's see how that plays out over the coming month or so. Uh, last week you mentioned that you know, Eddie received a legal letter uh, with regards uh, to discussions about the Chris Eubank Jr. Liam Smith fight. Um, is there anything coming your you know your way with regards to uh, that legal letter, or is it just like more like a warning type, just stop talking about it type of thing? What my way personally? Well, not you personally, but match room Eddie. No, look, we had it. Uh, you know, I don't pay too much attention to. Um, you know. I, 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 Legal letters, it's quite easy to send a legal letter, isn't it? You know, anyone could do it. Um, it's not my position. Look, we're just discussing a great fight that we'd love to make. You know, we're talking up a great fight that we want to make. You know, if they have an issue and they feel they have a contractual right, it's nothing to do with us. You know, like I say, we'll, we'll have warrants in place that if we make a fight, that the, the relevant party has the right to enter into that contract. You know, we're we can talk about fight all we want. You know, like I say, I'm not sitting there reading Chris Eubank Jr.'s contract. It's not my job. I don't have the right to do so. But if someone warrants that they're free and clear to enter into a fight, that's perfect for me. That's all I need. Um, so, you know, we sort of leave it there. Good stuff. Moving on, Tyson Fury um, obviously mentioned regards to uh, an email that was sent your way from George Warren last week, and George done an interview and clarified, you know, regards to the offer. Um, so obviously you've had the offer. I think the terms were 60-40 in the first fight and 50-50 in the rematch. Um, do you still think that position is right, or do you feel maybe things have changed with regards to who's worth more, etc.? I think it should be 60-40 for AJ now. I think we should switch it around, and then. And then, uh, and then the rematch 60-40 for AJ as well. Now look, there's, uh, there's so much talking in the heavyweight division, isn't there? You know, how many times have we spoken about this fight over the last few years? How many times have we spoken about a number of fights over the last few years? I think we've all got intent to make the biggest fights possible. There's so many big fights being spoken about now in the heavyweight division. Um, you know, there's the there's obviously the discussion around Joshua's August date and December date, um, and, and our focus is Anthony Joshua, no one else. You know, is delivering the right fight for Anthony Joshua. You know, we're not in the Tyson Fury business; it's not our place. If we can make a mega fight, that's what we will do. Um, but lots still ongoing. You know, we've obviously got the. Has been spoken about the AJ Dillian White fight for the summer, the AJ Deontay Wilder fight for the December. So lots of interesting things happening. You know, Usyk Fury as well for the undisputed. Um, so there, there's a number of big fights to look forward to. I'm very confident that a big, you know, mega fight will get made. Who that's against? Let's wait and see. Um, but so much talking and uh, not enough action in the past. I think we've got focused on the action piece now, rather than the talking to the cameras about it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but it's interesting that because obviously as fans we've seen, you know, AJ is going to fight. He's not going to sit out there a year, fight somebody in December for a huge payday from uh, Skills Challenge, and then we've seen he's going to fight Dillian White in a warm-up fight, and then do that. And now we're seeing forget the December, forget White. It could be feuding in September. So out of them three potential options, which one do you think is most likely? If you rate them in orders one to three, would one be the most like likely option? Most like, I mean, first and foremost, August is the most likely, is to keep AJ active and fight in August. That's number one. Uh, number two is obviously the focus then for the, Dillian, uh, the Deontay Wilder fight, sorry, for December. And then number three is the is probably Fury. I, I think is, you know, I, I still feel Wilder's the favorite, um, but it doesn't mean we won't entertain the Fury talks, uh, of course, but at the same time, you know, we've been down this road a lot. So, and I'm sure Fury and the team will be talking to Alexander Usyk still. I know he's, Usyk's got the Dubois fight, not to look, be looked past in August, but we all have to think about the longer term plans. Um, so, you know, I, I still think, first things first, our job is to focus on that August date and keep the momentum and, and you know, keep AJ active because in the past that's where, you know, it, it, struggled a little bit with the momentum you know with the new trainer in Derek James we saw a great you know a great performance and improved Anthony Joshua on April 1st I think you're going to continue to see improvements I think August will be great for that and then a, a massive one in December as well last question for you Frank um, 
Malaysia, I think I saw a while ago that you was in Malaysia discussing, I'm assuming, similar sort of thing to what you've got going on in Abu Dhabi. Uh, how far are we off potentially a date in Abu Dhabi, for, uh, sorry, Malaysia? Hopefully not far. You know, like these things, they take a long time. Our first event we did in Abu Dhabi took us 10 months from discussion starting, sorry, 11 months from discussion starting and the first event taking place. Um, you know, especially working with governments, it takes a lot of work to get things done. You know, Malaysia is an interesting market for us, not just for boxing. I was talking about, you know, our other core sports of, you know, snooker because of the, you know, location close to China as well. Snooker's a huge opportunity, got a huge opportunity there. Nine ball pool as well is a big sport for us and darts, obviously. Um, so looking at a, a number of different uh, sports to go to Malaysia but like I say it does take time it's not an overnight thing um, but hopefully sooner rather than later we'll get something up and running those conversations are ongoing you know into a little bit more detail now um, and that's really for us that's the you know it's the big that's the big driver for us now is you know going to working with governments and looking to open up new locations for boxing and you know any financial backing that we can bring into boxing is good for the sport if we can give more opportunity to fight to fighters and more opportunity to make the mega fights that maybe haven't been made in the past you know I think that's only beneficial so it's not just uh, Abu Dhabi Malaysia we, we got talks in another number of markets you know we'll be announcing our, our return to Monaco very soon as well for later this year which we're very excited about because we had I think four great shows in Monaco at a break during COVID obviously but now back up and running um, and yeah that, that, like I say that's the focus for us now if we can deliver massive opportunities for our fighters you know and uh, make fights that maybe would be difficult to make without the backing of governments I think it's great for the sport. It's interesting stuff there uh, you just mentioned uh, Monaco there could we, ex ex when could we expect that date and potentially what names are going to be headlining there? We're probably looking at we're looking at a date early November for that. Um, hopefully, announce it in the next couple of weeks. In terms of names, we're just a little bit too far out right now. I'd say in terms of getting something locked in. You know, we've got the boxing calendar. It's always hard six months out. Um, but we, you know, we're focusing on certain territories and fighters that will make sense. And uh, as as the schedule over the next month or so plays out, we'll be able to plot people in there. So, uh, but you know, it'll be a great show, a great return back there. You know small crowd of just 350 in the in the casino of Monte Carlo is going to be uh, quite sensational. It's always a tremendous atmosphere in there and looking forward to four great fights on that card. And the last thing, uh, Frank, any more signings? I know you signed uh, Rodriguez the other day, it was just announced. Any more in the pipeline? Any British fighters potentially? Yeah, we've got a couple we're talking to at the minute. We're, we're working through some details on um, some exciting fighters both in the UK and US. You know, like I said the other day, I, the, the key for us is continue to expand and build the best stable in boxing globally. Um, you know, I think over the last two months we've signed some tremendous fighters, and that's been our focus as well. You know, as much as we may have lost some fighters, you know, I think we've brought in some brilliant fighters. And th and there's only so many fighters you can service as well. And you know, we'll always. You know, the key for us is always being able to deliver for the fighters we sign. It's quite easy to say, come over, I'll give you four or five fights, and then after a year not deliver two. Um, you know, we, we want to deliver for the fighters we sign, and that's, you know, that's what we'll continue to do. And, uh, yeah, a couple of, couple of new names coming on board and excited by them. Good stuff, Frank. appreciate your time uh, in this uh, blistering heat. Do you want to recommend anything in Abu Dhabi to do, seeing as you've been here that many times and you work with the tourism board? I'm putting you on the spot now. Yes, um, one restaurant I love, there's a restaurant called M, M Sharif on the Corniche, unbelievable food. Uh, go to Ferrari. What, what kind of food? It's, I've completely forgot the, the food. It's unbelievable though, go there. Uh, I'm useless at remembering things, but I'm good at remembering restaurants. Uh, Ferrari World is great. The golf course at Sadia Island is unbelievable. Um, what else is there? There's tons of, there's so many things to do. The Water Park as well, the Warner Brothers. Is there a new Sea World's just opened yeah. as well? There is so much to do in Abu Dhabi. Get down here. If you can't get down here now, we'll be back here in September. Massive fight and enjoy everything. Bring the kids. They can go and enjoy the Water Park. You can enjoy the boxing. See you then. Frank Smith, appreciate your time. Thank you. Cheers, man.